Today we are doing the storybook style. Now the tutor walked so the storybook could run. This whimsical and lesser known style is about to charm your socks off. If you haven't watched the two videos before this, they aren't necessary, but are recommended. So I will have those linked at the end of the video. But for now, let's talk about where the storybook style came from. The storybook home is usually a small-ish cottage with one or two floors, but the elements of the style aren't limited to size. It was born in the Los Angeles area in the early 20th century, but can be found across the states. Traditionally constructed of brick and stone and covered with stucco and shingles, this arts and crafts era home was heavily inspired by romanticized European styles. Tudor and Tudor Revival are obvious contributors, and the Tudor Revival movement was happening around the same time, but other heavy influences included Gothic, English Cottage, and French Norman Revival. I want to mention quickly how much the technology at the time lent itself to styles like this. Photography and books and travel were all becoming more and more accessible, so even though Tudor and storybook homes were mostly for the wealthy, the fact that that information was even available, that the average person could see what life was like across the world through these means, just absolutely amazing. Now, of course, we have Pinterest, and of course, all the information you see here will be linked in the board below. The storybook style had a short run initially thanks to the Great Depression, but they remain an inspiration to niche home style lovers, which apparently includes you and me. What do we love about them? Their high-pitched roofs, arched doors and windows, absence of straight lines in the roof line and siding, which is pretty difficult to recreate in The Sims, but I will point out the importance of front-facing gables and we'll curve some roofs and stuff, so we'll do our best. Dormers, towers, stained glass, and as much whimsy as you can pack in. Landscaping usually follows through with ivy, flowers, bushes, trees, lawn decorations, and winding paths that all lean toward the well-planned chaos that we find so endearing. The proportions in any other sort of finish would look ridiculous. A roof twice the height of walls on a ranch? Absolutely not. Overplanted window boxes and ivy crawling all over a mid-century modern? Obnoxious. But somehow, the storybook style pulls it off. Let's dive in. All right, we've got good news and bad news. The good news is the little shiny house thing is gone. Super happy that they fixed that. The bad news is I can't get this menu to disappear anymore. Super annoying. If anyone knows of a mod that's going to fix that, please let me know as soon as possible because like this is literally the first video I've recorded since the update <laughs> and it's already driving me crazy. So anyway, let's talk about how to actually construct this storybook home. Oftentimes I try to find how to like build out with rectangles. For example, um, right, the split level, it's a series of boxes sort of stacked on top of each other. This one, not really the case. It was a very customizable sort of home style where you would find a specific architect, they'd build it to your needs and all that stuff. So it's going to be a follow me while I do an out outline kind of build as opposed to specific rectangles, but I'll explain as we go along. And we're going to start over on the left side. So, oh, this is a 20 by 30 lot, by the way. I'm going to start with an eight tile wall down this side. And then the front of the build is going to resemble that American Tudor where it's a lot of in and out and in and out, which makes sense because it's a Tudor based American style. But we'll go two, one, three, one, two, two, three, one, four. You can see the front coming together there, and then off the back, we're actually going to go three, one, two, one, four, one, five, and this will line up with this part of the wall right here. Then I'm actually going to go down one, over two, and down, and I'm going to actually leave this space open for the tower, but I am going to add a little bit of a sunroom right off the side there, just because it's cute. For the tower, I'm going to use the smallest rounded room. This is going to be our dining area, and you can actually fit a good sized table in there. But the round tower is actually sort of one of the things that sets this um, sort of size and style apart. I'm going to grab this platform here as well. Hopefully it does what I want it to. We'll see. The round tower is sort of what is going to set this apart most from the Tudor style, as, along with some of the like more gothic elements and everything. There's a raised dining area. It's more soft and whimsical than you typically find in a Tudor, which was generally much more boxy and angular. Um, let's go ahead and do the floor plan for the first floor and then we'll move up. So again, the floor plan was generally quite customized to whatever the client's needs were, but I knew that I wanted a nice big main bedroom and attached bath on the first floor as well as a family bath. This will turn into a sort of stairwell as well as exit to the outside. And then the entry hall here, I actually also want to put on a platform. Different platform heights weren't necessarily an aspect of the style. Um, I just was looking for more ways to incorporate that sort of fun, whimsical element, and I thought that was a good way to do it. Now my room is not rooming, so I'm going to draw it out like that, and then once again, grab one of these, oh, never mind. Place one of these outside, I guess and fix it up so that I can place it inside here. Okay, that's better. Now, if you have a round platform inside, this little bug is inevitably going to happen. It's really sad, but you can sort of hide it 
by using one of the floor trims that has sort of a lip on it. Pretty much covers it, and it doesn't affect the functionality at all. I'm going to do some L-shaped stairs. So I'll turn this, but I actually want to slide it up so that I can place the stairs in like this. And then that will leave space for doors over here. For now, I'll just be sticking with plain base game doors um, for the bathroom, the bedroom, and of course over here for this bathroom as well. I did want more bedrooms upstairs and they will be pretty spacious again, but the first thing I actually want to do is copy and place this tower just to get that out of the way. And this is just going to be standard level. Of course, that's not lining up, but hopefully it'll fix itself. So we're going to follow this sort of outline of the building here making sure we wrap around the staircase, but this will actually come straight down. And we're going to go over two and then in one, over two, out and back around to connect. That did not do what I wanted it to do, so let's try again. I'm just going to actually draw this room in and now it works magically. Upstairs lining up with the base of the stair, I'm going to draw a little bedroom right here, another bedroom here, this bedroom which will have access to the tower i'm going to go ahead and delete those walls now and cross my fingers nothing breaks excellent and then there's plenty of room for another bathroom upstairs as well as sort of an office or secondary living area here the last few sets of walls that we have to add will include a chimney off the back here i'm going to start going all the way up but i'll adjust it to being half walls if i need to and then i'm also going to add a chimney here same thing, go all the way up, but I'll adjust the height if I need to. So what does this look like? Before we add a roof, it just looks like a conglomeration of boxes, which is perfect. If you'd like to add some beams, you can go ahead and remove the ceiling of whatever room you want to add them to. Grab your smooth keeper fence, make sure the grid is on the correct level, and you want to place them perpendicular to whatever the sort of uh, peak of the roof will be running. So the peak of the roof will be running in this direction. So if I wanted to add beams in here, I would want to be placing them in this general direction like this. Now over here you can see I can actually add that inlaid exterior trim which will just cover up that little bit of white showing and if you have get to work I highly recommend using this one the fence for window shopping. That fence you can't actually really see it very well but when you add that inlaid exterior trim it still looks like a beam from the inside you just don't have to deal with these little sort of knob things. Let's talk about the roof though. I'm actually going to start right here in this little section with a half gabled roof piece. I'm actually going to push it in to here and then I'm going to press alt so that I maintain the same height but adjust the pitch. And then this is the pitch that I will be using for pretty much the whole roof. From here I can use a just plain old gabled roof piece and pitch it up until it lines up and that'll give me a really strong really high peak. If you watched either of the Tudor builds then you're definitely recognizing some of these elements right now and at this point it's just sort of copy and place wherever possible. So we'll have it like this here. I'm wondering if the beams are going to not be worth it just because of how round rooms don't play nicely so I might have to get rid of those. I'm going to copy, rotate, and place this piece over here and it'll actually line it up with this little wall right there. Now I can't actually pull this all the way back because then it'll clip through. You could grab a half hip roof piece for just this part right here. Match the pitch, draw out the eaves, perfect. But for the most part, we're just going to be using this gable piece. Put it right here on this roof. Of course, I don't really like this element right here, so I'm going to draw it all the way in to be just one tile wide. Hold shift to tuck that even, copy, place, and pull these eaves in. And now I can use that anywhere um, where I don't want the roof to be showing through. For example, right over here. I'll place that first piece, then place the second piece, pull it into the roof until it lines up, and perfect and do the same thing down here. Now, in order to keep this roof from causing issues with this room, what I'm going to do is push it back one tile and then hold shift to pull the eaves over. It's the easy way to do it. There are more complex ways to do it. I have a lot of videos on my channel on how to do that, but I'm going to do the easy way today. For the sunroom, I actually want to use a half hip roof piece, pitch it down a bit, maybe do shift C and add a little bit of a curve, grab a glass texture that seems like a good idea. And there we have the beginnings of a sunroom. Of course, it'll make more sense when we add the windows. And then for the tower, just going to add a nice round roof piece. Now in a perfect world, I wouldn't have this little valley right here. However, this particular angle, this, 
This is not an angle that exists um, in roofing, um, so to get it to line up would be more trouble than it's worth. Trust me, I tried. Last little bit of structure I want to add is just going to be a small platform off the front here. That's because remember we did raise the inside platform one so that will just help the door line up nicely. And it might add a little bit of a deck off the back here. Nothing too crazy though, most of the space I'd rather dedicate to gardens. With all of that, I'm going to raise the foundation ever so slightly, and let's talk about what we've created. Now that all of the roof pieces are on, you can definitely tell, I mean, I have a tutor right here, so you can literally see the similarities. We've got a ton of overlapping front-facing gables that are relatively high. The main difference here is that we are adding a round tower. Um, and you could add more towers and more roundness other places as well, and we're going to get to the roof again in just a second. But just as sort of a core style, it does look very Tudor in its sort of shell. And if you just wanted to grab this same wallpaper and throw it on here, it would be lovely. But that's not what we're doing. It is now time to begin contemplating adding whimsy and sort of that fantasy element. And we're going to start that by going back to the roof pieces and actually accentuating some more of them and curving some of them. I speak frequently about not having too many pitches on a build unless it fits the style, and this is one of those cases where you can have every roof a different pitch if you wanted to, and it would still work fine. Now, I'm not mentally prepared to go quite that crazy, but for this one, for example, I would like to pitch it up a bit, and if I bring it up to the point where it's sort of at the same level as this one, we're going to get a little bit of repetition, but the repetition is interrupted by the difference of shapes, and that is what adds whimsy. I'm going to press Shift C to get a little bit more control over this roof piece. And the first thing I'm going to do for all of the roof pieces regardless is actually bring this one up as far as it'll go. It doesn't add much of a curve to the base, but it does add a little bit and that's just, it's nice. It's that little something. It's like switching out from the default shingle pattern. It just adds that little something that makes your build look that much more intentional. Now I'm also going to drop down these options just a smidge to get a little bit of that curve there. Now with a roof that is this narrow, it's going to be difficult to curve it too much without it looking too silly, right? Because at this point we're starting to get some hard angles in there and I do not want that. But if you decided to curve a wider roof piece like this one, you could get it much more um, much more dramatic and not actually have those harsh angles. Now curving it like this while intersecting multiple levels, as you can see right here, not great. So I'm not going to be curving that one, but what I am going to do is actually create more of a curve for the entry here. Now for this one, I will have to adjust both the front gable as well as the sort of half gable behind it simultaneously, which can be kind of tricky, but we'll give it a go. So I've curved up the ends of the eaves and now I'm going to take this piece and drop it down just a little bit and then take this one and try and match it up the same way. But that adds a little bit more of an interesting shape there right at the entry. I also want to pitch this tower roof up and again, give it just a little bit of a curve, something interesting to look at, not too much. And you can see we're moving farther and farther away from the Tudor style, which I didn't necessarily anticipate having this build here. I just put it there for a TikTok I made the other day, but it's working out as a pretty good example. Uh, for the rest of the roof pieces, I'm just gonna go through, shift C and um, actually just, like I said, curve those eaves up just a little bit. If you're a fan of deep overhanging eaves, this is a great style to bring that in again. You can hold shift and just pull out on any of the front facing eaves to just move those. Now let's talk about what packs we're using. Because this is such sort of a, a fun, interesting artistic style, you can throw any pack at it and it's going to look great so long as you follow a few sort of basic principles. Um, the main principle is that you get the shell to have multiple front facing gables with some sort of curved roof and exaggerated peaks here and there. And then beyond that, good shingle options, you could go with thatched, right? So you've got sort of the thatched storybook style, very nice. You get some of these shaken up shingles, or this would be a great place to use some of these scalloped shingles and really in a really fun color. Like of all the styles to use some of these fun colors and textures, this is it. I recommend trimming out your roof in whatever color you're going to be using. Um, I think I'm going to probably end up with brown, so I'll be using brown. But if you want to use white sort of windows and doors and everything, go with white. You can see here, I am actually going to have to adjust this a bit. So I'll just hold alt and drag up ever so slightly until it matches up. Mm. This worked the first time I did it, but it doesn't want to work now. Oh well, that's all right. So now that we've discussed some of the roofing options, let's talk about siding. I found that the werewolves pack actually has a lot of really great stuff for the style, which is kind of funny. Like you don't think of werewolves being whimsical and magical and fun, or I don't generally, um, but this really 
sort of worn down siding looks really fun. Shingled siding like you find in cats and dogs is another super popular option. You've also got stone, brick, which is generally not a red brick, that's sort of reserved for more the Tudor style. My helper is trying to help here, so we'll see what comes of that. More rough stone, cut stone, plaster also all very popular options and of course if you really just can't escape your infatuation with the tudor style not that i would know anything about that you could of course just stick with that get together wallpaper as well really you can make pretty much any texture work now that I've sort of settled on the colors for my exterior, kind of going in a cool direction, let's talk about doors and windows. Now for doors and windows, anything in the sort of cottage direction from cottage living would work really well, doors or windows. The small panes definitely would prefer those over the, say, larger, just plain glass doors. If possible, grabbing something arched or with stained glass would definitely up that sort of storybook whimsy medieval side. But of course you could go with something a little bit more intimidating if you wanted to pull in more of the gothic roots or some French inspired doors like the double glass door. Again, these were very, very custom built homes for the most part. Um, this wasn't like one of those kit homes where you'd order and you'd have two different door options or something. So you want to stay away from anything too mid-century or too modern. For windows, much like with the Tudor style, if possible, go with smaller panes of glass and cross panes like these or these, again, cottage living. This window from Discover University is actually really good as well. Or of course the get together windows. I really like the snowy escape windows. I love that they're just like the perfect size and they have the smaller panes. Those are really nice. But of course you could go full out whimsical with the uh, realm of magic stuff, pull in some gothic elements with something a little bit more arched and pointy. Bay windows, definitely a thing uh, if you feel like they suit your design, but they're not necessary. And you could definitely go contemporary if you wanted to with this style with just a few tweaks like we've mentioned in several other videos, right? Streamline the roof, go for more flat white faces where you can as opposed to the stone, um, and then get large paned windows like this. You could definitely bring it in a more contemporary direction. That could be fun. Uh, yeah, but as for me, I will be sticking with the, just the base game. And I'm going to recommend that you try and get your colors to match, but don't worry so much about all of the windows themselves matching. Now up in this large peak here, if you have packs for it, I would definitely recommend grabbing some of the more um, cottage-like bay or oriel windows like this one. That will fill in the space nicely and stick with the style. If, however, you don't, you can use a little half hip roof piece sort of pushed into the roof here, right? But that gives something to that sort of empty peak space. It gives that little bit of roof, which, believe it or not, you could put a little bit of a curve on if you really wanted to get fancy there. How heavily you window this is totally up to you. Typically, I'd say it's about mid-range window heaviness. Obviously, you want to prioritize towers. That's kind of a given. Towers always have a lot of awesome windows, as well as the sunroom over here. But for the rest of it, if it fits, it fits. If it doesn't, don't force it. I totally forgot to mention foundations. I recommend making the trim match sort of whatever your doors and windows and roof trim and everything is. And I'm just going to go with a nice dark brick to sort of let it blend right into the ground. Don't want to call too much attention to it. Um, I would use a stone that matched the rest of the build, but I don't have a foundation with that texture because that would just be too dang convenient. To color the side of that platform, remember those are down here in the platform trim section. I'm just going to use the same thing and cross my fingers that the stairs connect. Yay! I'm going to paint in the side here with the brickery paint color since it'll match the foundation. Let's add some chimneys while I'm out here because I always forget those. If you have any chimneys that sort of have the chimney pots on top of them or are more interesting in shape like this one, go for that. But for all my base game buddies, I'm just going to be using this one scaled down a bit because I want the smoke effect, but I don't necessarily need to see the chimney. Of course, if you wanted to leave them seen, that's totally fine too. Now inside, we do have a couple of things to finish up here. I want to place a spandrel here. Now, ideally I'd use cats and dogs, the cottage living or the vampires one. Those are all just really fun um, or do something more simple like the seasons. However, I don't have those. So I will be using maybe this one. That'll be okay. Using this spandrel and a couple of columns to open up from the entry space into the sort of main living area of the cottage. Also while we're here, I want to briefly touch on expansion, something I forgot to mention in the last couple of videos, but if you do want to sort of expand this space, um, give your sims more room to roam, expand your family or whatever, a great direction to do that would just sort of be in this general area. Um, it'd just be really easy to turn this bathroom into a hallway and come around and have more bedrooms over here. You could also expand this way and do another room over on this side and add a second story off the back here. I don't recommend going more than two stories except for a tower maybe here or there. 
Uh, for the most part, you want to stick with two stories, but you can go as far back as you want. This could be quite a large build, even though they're traditionally a bit smaller. I'm going to use that exact same thing to open up into the sort of sunroom space, which I forgot to actually put windows in, just to have it partially open, you know? Now for flooring, you could do wood or stone or some combination thereof. I'm just going to stick in the same general color palette and do the same sort of color floors as the rest of my um, house. Now I do have to deal with this up here. Either I can rotate the floor so that it all lines up, or I can pretend that the problem doesn't exist. I could also come in with some sort of rustic cottage looking stone. And if you use Control F, you do get quarter tile placement, which can be handy to do fun little stuff like that. For the fireplaces, the more fun and whimsical, the better. Of course, I am just sticking with base game, so I'm gonna stick with this one, but this could be really fun if it matched sort of the color palette of the rest of your build. If you're doing something larger, you could definitely throw down something from vampires. And this little guy from the paranormal pack is just adorable. And similarly with the wallpaper, there aren't really that many rules. If you want dark and spooky, of course, Vampires Delivers. Cottage Living would definitely pull in more of the cottage elements. If you went with half timbers outside, you could definitely bring them inside for more of that Tudor style, or you can go with just some nice basic wallpaper. Don't forget to match your stairs up. Now for the kitchen, I am just going to do a little L over in this corner, sticking with sort of the more rustic cottage style. Cottage Living or Snowy Escape would be great. Vampires, Realm of Magic. Of course, I will be sticking with the usual escargot. This would be a really fun place to use this set for the kitchen if you can uh, afford it, of course. It is pretty expensive. And I highly recommend using a round table if you decide to use this for your dining area. It fits the aesthetic of the tower really, really nicely. Um, and it's a less traditional, less, um, what's the word? Angular. It's a less angular shape. We're cutting down on angles over here. So that could be nice. Then of course you've got plenty of space for a living space, office, bookshelves, sitting areas. Now for external doors, you could totally go with a sliding door or go with something a little bit more rustic feeling with a double glass door like that. For this bathroom, I think I'm just going to stick with a basic half bath since we could put the full bath upstairs. But since everything else in the house is kind of expensive, I'll use some of the higher end stuff. Which reminds me, where is that new light switch supposed to be? There it is, on the switchable switch. I don't care enough to put this in the build today. I just wanted to, to know where it was. I am recoloring my doors to match the rest of the wood a little bit. And I'm not taking too much time on the bathrooms spa bathroom spaces because I do want this to be sort of ready to move in and decorate. Um, but I'm really excited to talk about the landscaping again because we're talking about cottage style landscaping once again, which I really enjoy. But I will make sure that I do a full bath upstairs for the children or whoever else lives here. I guess it doesn't have to be kids. I just kind of default to kids. Of course, before we move on to landscaping, as always, if you're enjoying the video, don't forget to leave a like. That lets YouTube know that this is good content and they should give it to more people, which would of course be super fun. As of right now, we're about to close on the 5,000 subscriber mark, which is super crazy. We'll probably be there by the time this video is up, honestly, which is like, just blows my mind. That was my 2024 goal was 5,000, so thank you so much for helping us hit that. Now, I actually wanna focus on the front yard, just I find it's, it's easier to do it sort of all in the same area, so I'm going to scooch this house back. However, what we're going to talk about could apply to front yard or backyard. Now, we could do more of a classic suburban style landscaping like this, or we could go for a more cottage style landscaping like this. The last time I did a pretty simple cottage garden, so this time I'm going to switch it up a little bit and do something a bit more complex. But it's going to start the exact same, just grab some dirt paint and sort of outline where you want your garden to be. I do recommend still sticking with more organic shapes, and I definitely want to have a sort of flower lined path. So I'm going to start with placing some plants over on this side, and some plants over here and maybe here as well, perhaps we'll do a gazebo. So this is where I want my plants. Now this is significantly more landscaping than we did on the English Tutor, which is when I last covered the English cottage garden sort of method that I have, because of course everything's a formula over here. So last time I had you pick one shrub, three flowers, and one filler. This time we're going to actually pick two shrubs, and we're still going to pick three flowers, but it'll be a little bit different. So if you missed the first one, we're gonna start with picking two shrubs, which is anything largish, greenish, and 
not flowering. These are kind of the base game options, although of course you could use, oh and this one, although of course you can use stuff from packs if you have them and you want to. Now mine isn't going to be super high class, so I'm probably going to pick this one and then something with a little bit more fluff and texture to it, like this. Next you're going to pick three flowers, which is literally anything that has flowers on it. Now here's where I'm going to deviate from the last one. We're actually going to break these down into swatches. So if your flowers have swatch options, go through and actually pick three different colors for each one. They can complement one another across the different flowers, or they cannot. This one only has three swatches, so we'll just use all of those. But like this one, I'll pick some blue, I'll pick some white, and I'll pick some purple to try and match with some of these other plants. Now, here's the deal with the swatches. If you remember from the other video, the reason that we use just a few different specific plants is so that we can scatter them all throughout the garden and it'll look like there's a big variety without actually being too overwhelming or using too many different plants to the point of it looking crazy, which, I mean, if that's what you wanna go for, go for it. I prefer a slightly more structured crazy look. So structurally unstructured, but if it's a slightly larger space, then pre-selecting some swatches and making sure you like how they all work together is a really great option. Like right now, I'm seeing that these two colors are actually super duper similar to each other. I want to keep the dark blue, but I think I might actually switch this one out for something a little bit brighter and pull in some of that yellow. But from here, it's pretty much the same method as before. You're gonna start with a shrub, place it in a total of an odd number sort of spread out throughout your garden beds. Don't forget to resize with the bracket keys because we are all about texture and size differences with this garden setup. And you're actually going to do that with all of your shrub items this time because instead of just having the one, you should have two. You could go with three if you really wanted to, but again, I prefer it to be a little bit more on the minimal side while still having that variety and um, texture and tonal differences that make the English cottage garden so very charming. If you like rocks, now is a great time to add rocks. I'm going to stick with a cool blue tone to try and sort of match what else is going on in my build. And I love resizing these as well to turn them more into boulders as opposed to just plain old garden stones. You can always add more later as well, but I like at least starting with a few at this stage. And then you're going to go through with your flowers and do the exact same thing as we did last time. Place them in groups, of, well not groups, but place them in increments of five. So you'll take one, and you'll place about five of them around and then take the next one and place about five and keep going. Now, since I have a couple of larger bushes as well as smaller ones, I'll probably end up placing more of the smaller ones than the larger ones. But the whole sort of idea of this go through and place some and then pick another one and go through and place more of that sort of technique is that the garden will build upon itself as you go while not having to think ahead too much about making sure you're placing things randomly and making sure that you're resizing everything properly and all that stuff. So I will be resizing as I go a bit if I could get this to place. There we go. Uh, but that's sort of why I like this method. You don't have to think ahead too much. It just sort of comes together. And who doesn't love that? Once your garden is all nice and filled in, you can go through and resize, scooch stuff around. If you feel like you need it, you can definitely still go in with some of that low-lying filler plants we talked about last time. These little guys are good, the little daisies. You all know I love my low-lying pale yellow flowers. I just like sort of using them to finalize sort of the outline of the garden space. What I'm looking for when I'm going through is I don't want to see too many of the same swatch of the same plant bundled together. I want to make sure I'm resizing here and there to make sure that the height differences stay relevant and important and actually like add to um, the variation of the landscaping. So that's looking pretty fun. Next, I'm going to go back in with the dirt again and place it where I'm going to actually be placing a path and then go through with the gravel or flagstone or whatever it is I'm using. This creates a nice soft blend with the landscaping and just helps it all look like it's been there for a little while. Now, do we have enough space here to actually create a pergola? We kind of do actually, so let's do that. I'm gonna grab a little room like this and then use my smooth keeper fence in a complementary color to the rest of my build to draw a few lines across the top just like this. Now when I delete this, and of course delete those, I have the top of a pergola. From here I can add the inlaid exterior trim just like I did with those beams, a few columns on the correct level though, and there's a sort of little pergola. Now you can mix and match the colors as much or as little as you want. Sometimes if you're using just the base game, it can be really difficult to get the swatches to sort of all match. If you're feeling super extra, you can actually leave the grid at this level and add some plants to the top. If you have any packs that have climbing vines, that is definitely a must have for this build style, which I'll get into in just a second here when we actually finalize landscaping. Um, but you could put that up there and then, you know, chest table, easel, the classics. 
Before we part ways, I do want to talk about a few things to do if you have the packs that will really set the storybook style over the edge. Base game has a lot of really basic stuff in it, which, you know, you can't really fault it. It has to serve a lot of different styles. But if you have the packs to do more of the more interesting roof textures or window shapes and all of that, that's going to send it a really, really long ways. But also, if you happen to have any packs that have vines on them, 10 out of 10 recommend throwing some of those bad boys down. Put them over the windows or not, but really what this is going to do is help it look like it's been around for a longer time. And immediately that's going to give it some of those aged, like, cottage in the forest fantasy vibes. But even if you don't have vines, throwing down some window boxes is going to be a great way to get some of that greenery and life brought into the build. I like these because they sort of have little vines hanging over them, but you can see how just placing a few window boxes immediately brought the green up onto the build. It helps the home feel more at, more like part of the landscaping, um, just because there are green stuff and flowers on it now, and that's, that's literally how that works. Now, I didn't really want to put full-on windows on the front here, but I can put these little mega arch things. What are these called? Yeah, mega wall hanging arches on there, add some flowers, maybe maybe add a little lantern. Charming. So with the window boxes added, let's do a quick little last minute tour about what makes the storybook style a standout American style, even though it was fairly short-lived. Drawing heavily from the influences of the Tudor style, as well as Gothic, Gothic Revival, and a handful of other sort of European styles, the storybook style appealed largely to the wealthy in the California area, and it actually quickly became sort of a seaside or lakeside vacation home style. Uh, I do not live in California, but we still have a lot of storybook homes around along the lake, uh, which just, they're just beautiful to look at. Most of the style is really found on the outside, um, like floor plan and all that stuff isn't as relevant, but what you're going to notice is a heaping ton of front-facing gables of all different pitches and shapes. Definitely want some curved roof pieces in there if you could do it. Round towers and even square towers are definitely a style must-have. Windows are honestly going to depend largely on the region. Again, inside there's not really one floor plan that you really have to stick to, however, these did tend to be built back when closed-off floor plans were a little bit more common and open floor plans were just coming into the style, um, so you can keep that in mind while you're building or not. But since it was generally a home for the wealthy, you will want the bedrooms to be a pretty decent size. Hey look, there's no flooring in this room anymore because that's just exciting. Now the bean has notified me that we are out of time today. If you missed the Inherited Manor Challenge speed build that I just posted, there is a Discord server specifically for that challenge. I feel like that's going to be super duper helpful, although while I'm recording this, that video is not up yet. I also wanted one just for us to hang out and chat. If you guys have specific build suggestions, that would be a really great place to send them, especially if you have pictures or anything that'll help me sort of generate well, not generate, gauge, like which styles have the most interest in all of that stuff. And I'd love to start some of the conversations um, by actually uploading some photos of this build in different worlds, sort of highlighting different packs and how it can fit in. So I am out of time to talk about that today because parenting, but that is a great segue into the Discord server. So you can check out that link down below along with the rest of them. Playlists are here on the screen as usual. Hopefully you enjoyed this style and I look forward very, very much to building with you again very, very soon. Bye.